Good evening. Welcome along to NUFC Matters with me, Steve Wraith, and we've got Michael Shopra back on the show. Hi, Michael. How are you? Hi, Steve. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, very good, mate. Very good. Nice to nice to have you back on. And um, obviously, football has, has uh, restarted in the Premier League. Newcastle have uh, secured their place in the Premier League. And um, you and I have had a bit of jip on social media from people that say that we've been critical of Bruce. Um, look, he came in. He wasn't our first choice, but he's got the job done. Is it is it time we gave him a little bit of praise? Look, the end of the day, I'm a, I'm a Newcastle United fan. And I would never ever want my club to get relegated. Um, when they let Rafa go and appointed Steve Bruce, I personally thought it was a backward step. Um, and I thought it would be tough for Steve to come into a, a football club where myself and a lot of other fans uh, didn't give him a chance. Um, yeah, he's done well. Um, but... I still, I still go back to the way be, before this this COVID nineteen happened. The way the team were playing, it, it wasn't excitement. Um, it wasn't enjoyable football. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, since since the um, the restart of the Premier League happened, uh, Newcastle United have been fantastic. Um, maybe it's down to the players have got no pressure. Um, they can just go out there and express themselves because I do know that helps. You haven't got 40 odd thousand Geordies that if one of the players gives the ball away, they're going to jump on one of the players' backs and boo them and heckle them and that sort of thing. So, in a way, I think having no fans in the stadium has is, is probably helped. But Steve's done a good job. Do you know what I mean? He's kept Newcastle United in the Premier League, which, which is what every Newcastle United fan wants. Um, as to go as far as saying, would you give him a chance in everything when when the takeover happens? I, I wouldn't give the, I wouldn't give him a chance. You've got to bring somebody high profile and somebody who's got a, a good CV. Um, to me, Steve Bruce doesn't have a good CV as a manager. As a player, fantastic, but as a manager, I think he's, he's, he's his CV and uh, the amount of times he's been relegated and. The clubs he's tried to get promoted to the championship, it hasn't really worked for him. But um, yeah, so uh, you, you've got to give him credit. He's kept the club in the Premier League, which is which is what we wanted, and hopefully they can they can kick on in the last the last few games. Biggest disappointment for me in the last couple of weeks since we spoke was was the <coughs> FA Cup surrender made because you know for me the FA Cup hasn't really been taken seriously in Mike Ashley's era at the club. So to get to the quarterfinals, and we did make a bit of a meal of it, it has to be said, against the opposition that we were drawn against. To get Man City at home, whether there was fans there or not, I just felt that we set up really negatively and we didn't really go for it. Were you the same opinion? Yeah, and I was, I was once, once I seen the, the lineup an hour before kickoff, I was, I was disappointed. It was, it was a strange lineup because you go and play your first game against Sheffield United, you win comfortably 3 0, you're playing. Pretty much a four-four-two, two up front. Um, then you're playing against Villa. You get a draw. You don't you, you don't play well, but you have nicked a point. And then he's gone. And I keep going back to it, and everybody keeps going on about it, that. It's Rafa's tactics, the the five at the back, and that sort of thing. And Steve wanted to play his own formation, and he, he did do that after after the restart, and he got two good results. So why not? Go out and express yourselves against Man City. You've got nothing to lose. You go and play 4-4-2. Go and try and win the game. Even if Newcastle United got be 4-5-0, look, we'd expect that. Do you know what I mean? It's Man City. They're, they're one of the best teams in the, in the country, if not the, in Europe at the, at the minute. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, well, I was disappointed when I seen the lineup, and obviously when... Um, he changed the formation in, in, in the second half. He gave it a bit of a, a go, do you know what I mean? And the players gave it a bit of a go. But for Newcastle United to get into the quarter final in X amount of years, it, it was a great chance to try and express yourself. But it was, a, I, I, it was a poor performance and poor team selection from me. Yeah, I've got to be honest, the only thing that, that made us smile was that at least Mike Ashley's not going to have a. The privilege of walking away with a, you know, with, with an FA Cup under his belt. I'd hate, I'd hated him to take the credit for that. 
Yeah, that would have, that would have been a big disappointment. Um, you could just imagine him uh, if Newcastle United did win there. He'd be standing in the front of the bus and everything, uh, holding the cup up. But nah, look, we we want them to win a trophy and everything. But as things stand, Mike Ashley's not won anything for Newcastle Ball. A championship, uh, he's nothing won any, anything major, which, which in hindsight is a good thing, do you know what I mean? There's no, no praise for the man. Premier League results have been good though, uh, since we came back, project restart, I think we were talking in the build-up to that, we were concerned about you know, Newcastle United coming back and performing and the job hadn't been done then, we, we weren't mathematically safe, we still needed points in the bag, but you know, We've done really well, and it certainly looks as if the players have kept themselves fit, which in itself was a, is a major achievement when you've been locked down for, for three and a half months. Well, yeah, that, that, that was my main concern, Steve, was how well the players have been looking after themselves, because you can get some players that probably think the, slip, the restart's not going to happen and they'll have a jolly up and they'll, they'll do whatever they want. But to be fair, fair play to them. They've, they've showed their true professionalism and they've stuck at their work and they've, they've done well. Do you know what I mean? They've, they've, you look at St. Maximum since he's come back, he's been on fire and he's a big difference. And there's been talk of PSG and Tottenham and Arsenal that possibly want to want to try and sign him. And, and to be fair, the way he's been playing since, he, since he's come back, he's a, he's a standout performer and right, we saw that he probably deserve to be player of the month. Um, but then I look at, you go to Bournemouth and you absolutely play them off the park, you destroy them. Then we, when we come up against West Ham and it's poor performance, it's, it's like it's, um, you're putting paper over cracks and it's just, do you know what I mean? It's just a matter of time before you have one good game and one bad game. There's no consistency. So hopefully... In the next couple of games, obviously, we've got a big game against Man City, which will it'll be tough. But they can go out and express themselves. They've got nothing to worry about now. They're safe. And they've got nothing to lose. Hopefully, they can get a good result against Man City and kick off. Yeah, you mentioned in Maxim, and, and um, quite rightly so. There's a lot of interest you know, in him. But um, it almost seems as if that, that break has done him the world of good because he was blown a little bit hot and cold early on in the season, but uh, I, I had to laugh, you know, in, in the build-up to the project restart and, and, and the big kickoff again, he'd said that he'd done a lot of personal training with his dog in the back garden, so maybe that's the way forward. Yes, yeah, so I've seen a couple of his videos on Twitter, um, and it, it does make you laugh, do you know what I mean? Because you've got different types of players that, that do different things to try and get themselves fit. Obviously, St. Maximum's a bit of a trickster, so he'll, he'll play with a tennis ball and the dog will chase after it and he'll try and do his tricks and whatever with, with the dog, do you know what I mean? But you've got to give, give the life credit, do you know what I mean? Especially him, because I think if it wasn't for him, I think Newcastle United wouldn't be getting the performances and the praise that they're getting. I think you look at all the, all the top teams now and, give them, like I say, you've got to give the guy credit because I think during the season and leading up to to COVID-19, he, he wasn't really a standout performer. He, he reminded me a bit of like a Lua Lua where you do your tricks, you get your fans on the seat, but there wasn't any end product. But now you can, you, you're can you really seeing a top, top player, do you know what I mean? And for 16, 17 million, I think that, that's a bargain. Um, and hopefully, he can, he'll, he'll stay in the castle because I think, I think he likes the club, do you know what I mean? He likes the city. You can see him on Twitter, he interacts with the fans, which is brilliant. Not many players do that. And I think that's what he likes, do you know what I mean? And, and the fans are starting to love him now. I think you're right. I think, um, you know, from the moment that he came to Newcastle, he bought into the area. And, you know, there was nothing better than seeing him pop along to, you know, Newcastle's West End Food Bank and, and supporting their efforts up there, you know, a fans initiative, which is... is gone from strength to strength but yeah I mean he, he's you know he's bought into Newcastle United but he's bought into Newcastle at City as well hasn't he? Well that's the main thing and it, it, look it would have been tough for him because people especially French players they get a reputation oh he's typical French he's this he's that and when when he first come to the club I, I had my doubts because you're talking about I've seen, I've seen him play in the French League and he's a, 
he was a trickster, do you know what I mean? And I was thinking, how is he going to cope with the Premier League? How will he cope with Newcastle United that will be fighting relegation and they need to be having players in the team that are going to battle, they're going to try and grind out a 1-0 and, and, and that sort of thing. But look, he's been fantastic, do you know what I mean? And, you've, and he deserves all the applause he's getting. And like, like you were saying, he went down the through back. He doesn't have to do that, do you know what I mean? The club don't make him go and do that. He, he could say, I don't want to do that. I can, I, I, not many of the players do that sort of thing. But look, he's, he's put his foot out, he's put his neck out on the line. He, he, he sees Newcastle fans, his, his, his family, really. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's what's good about it. And when, when Newcastle United fans take to you, um, they'll show you the love and they'll give you as much passion and desire that they can give and they'll sing and try and get you up for games and everything. And I think that's why he's probably seen the best out of him at this moment in time. I think if he goes to London, I think he'll be a totally different player. I think London's a, a totally different city. I don't know if he, if he would suit that. I think he, he needs to be in an area where he goes to the supermarket and the fans are around him and that sort of thing. I think he likes the attention. And I believe he's, he's a top, top player. We just need a, a few more around him. We've had um, Joe Linton discussed on more than one occasion this season and certainly over the last few weeks since we got back into uh, the Premier League matches. And um, it seems little's changed with Joe Linton, it has to be said. Malcolm McDonald, obviously someone who wore the number nine with, with a plum, scored you know many, many goals at St James's Park, has been very critical of him. Um, have you seen anything in Joe Linton's attitude to, to suggest that there's, there's a player in there who will come out eventually? I th- look, Joe, it's a hard one for Joe Linton because, look, he, when, he, when he scored the goal against Sheffield United, obviously in the first half, I think it was, he missed the setter. Um, then you, you're thinking, well, is that going to be playing on his mind? Um, fair play to him. He, got, he was in the right position at the right time to score his goal. I think he can go on, go and kick on and, and get another one and, and show us fans what, what you really are about. Um, Bruce is playing them a bit on the wing now. Um, doesn't see him as a striker, which he come out and said in the press. Um, but I think there's probably too much pressure. Do you know what I mean? He, he can't handle the pressure, Joel Linton. He's a, he's a young striker that wanted the number nine shirt. He's not. Um, so I I, 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 I know I'm a striker myself, but I can't see Joel Linton being in. Newcastle United like top player, do you know what I mean? I know the price tag doesn't help and that sort of thing. I think if you paid five, ten million for him, nobody would be talking about him. Um, but because of the forty million price tag that he's got, it comes with a, a burden of, of weight on his shoulders that he's got to produce and score goals and he hasn't done that. So as fans and as a supporter we, we have a right to, to criticize. Yeah, I mean we've we've discussed it all season, you know, the forty million price tag. Which isn't his isn't his fault, and you know, luckily, um, since since the game's restarted, we've we've found our goal scoring form, and there's been some, you know, been some you know some really good goals. I mean, you you look back to the Bournemouth fixture in particular, and you know the finishes from Almiron and uh, Lazaro in particular were you know were, were stunning, and um, you know it, it it makes a change. You know, we found we're scoring we found we're scoring form at the right time to secure our place in the Premier League for next season. I think what's good about it is that the, the front players have got a lot of energy and they're starting to show that. Obviously, you know, um, Almiron can run all day, St. Maximum can run all day, Joe Linton can do a, a shift when he, when he puts his head to it. And then you've got a, the right back who you mentioned getting, uh, getting up and down and, and getting in the box and scoring a great goal, do you know what I mean? And, but it goes out again. Would they be doing this when fans are there? Because they're not going to be playing behind closed doors for all the next season. Do you know what I mean? There's going to be fans and, and there's going to be pressure on players. And do you see these performances when, when there's pressure on? I go back to before COVID, we, we didn't see these performances when, when there was pressure on the players. But it's just nice to actually see the Castle United climbing up the table and they've got a chance of finishing in the top half, which is a, a good thing. Um, and hopefully... With, with them having a good season this year, hopefully they can they can kick on next year if there's going to be fans. But it's a, it's a totally different board game. It's 
I was watching some games and you look at Sheffield United and it's like a training game for them. Do you know, if Sheffield United came to St. James and it was like a training match. They didn't, they didn't have any desire, they didn't have any bottle. I don't know if it was because they played a couple of games a couple of days before that um, against Villa, but some teams of, of, who Newcastle played against have the same week, the same the fitness level seemed very low, whereas credit to Newcastle, the fitness levels are sky high. What did you make of um, you know the atmosphere? As I'm, you know, I know you watch a lot of the games. It doesn't have to be Newcastle. Um, obviously, no fans there. Um, you know what? What have you made of, of that? And, and what have you made of the, the effort that you know the networks have put in to, to put the crowd noise on? For me personally, um, I haven't really noticed much difference. You know, I, I sit and watch the football. I don't watch the crowds. And when you have the option of having the sound on or off, I've, I've tried both. And I've got to be. Off, I've got to be honest. I've, I've always watched it with the sound on. I do find it. You know, it just makes it more normal. But how have you found it? It's, it's, it's been a bit different because, um, like you say, I've, I've done both, do you know what I mean? It's, it's good to, to listen to what the players are saying on the pitch. Uh, being a player myself, it's good to, to, get a, to hear what they're saying and how they're trying to encourage other, other teammates. But then you don't really notice for the crowd. I think the only time I noticed it was when, when they, they put the, um, when they played Man City and they put Blue Moon on, do you know what I mean? And they played the same James as Park and... Blue Moon, you can get Blue Moon in the background. I think that would never ever happen. Do you know what I mean? It's just little things like that. Um, but look, some people like it with a with a noise in the background. I think it is as fans. Some some people get boring just watching a game. It would be watching a game with the with the volume off. Do you know what I mean? You could sit in the living room with your mates and, and watch a game and have a chit chat with the, with the volume down. Um, I personally prefer it with, without the crowd noise in the background. Just Purely because I like to, yeah, what's getting said and, and who's encouraging who, because then you'll see the leaders in the team. So I think, I think, look, they've tried to help the football fans as much as possible. The fans that can't get to the stadium and trying to make it in, enjoyable uh, watching a game on TV. Um, but for me, it's it, it's it hasn't really worked. You know what I mean? It's I prefer it without without the noise, Steve. Okay. The other topic we were speaking quite heavily about when, when you were last on was, was of course, Matty Longstaff, uh, the ongoing uh, contract situation. And um, Matty, of course, hasn't started him now until, well, I think it was January. 2-2 um, draw with Everton was the time that he last started. Now, he did sign an extension at the end of the season, but uh, still uh, no answer. And Steve Bruce has been asked about it on numerous occasions, asked if they've had a decision you know, I think the last time he had the press conference, he said, unfortunately, no. They kept it away. They've got two or three weeks now till the end of the season. Um, he keeps saying that they've done everything they can to reassure him that his future is at Newcastle and that they've made him a wonderful offer. The ball's in his court. Um, and it's up to him where he wants to ply his trade. So, obviously, Bruce keeps saying that he hopes that, you know, he sees his future at St. James's Park. Do you think Matty Longstaff sees his future at St James's Park? I think Matty Longstaff needs to... I think the club needs to show him what he's worth. Uh, obviously, no disrespect to him, but he'd, he'd, be, he'd probably be on peanuts now because it's basically his team contract, you know what I mean? And he'd come in and done really well. Um, obviously, there's been talk about Udinese, 30 grand and, and stuff like that, but you, you don't know how true it is. You don't know how much... His agents put out in the press to try and bump his deal up in Newcastle. But then you need to find out the truth about Newcastle. How much have they really offered? I know Steve Bruce says they've given him a, a great offer, but he's probably only on five, six hundred quid a week at the minute, Steve. So a great offer to Matty Longstaff could be three, four, five, six, seven grand. Do you know what I mean? To Steve Bruce and everybody else, that's a great offer. But in terms of what players are on in the first team in Newcastle, it's, it's not a great offer, do you know what I mean? He deserves more than that. Um, and then you've got to look at Mike Ashley's the owner of the football club now. Why would Mike Ashley want to be forking out 15, 20 grand on a player that if the takeout do, doesn't go ahead, they've got Mike Longstaff, and I would think he would sign a five-year deal. He's got Mike Longstaff on, on a big money for, for five years. So it's, it's tough. I know Steve's come out and said that he's sat with him, had a chat, and... 
Um, he's done this and done that. And Matty signed a contract extension. He didn't have to do it. He could have left the club, do you know what I mean? And started discussing uh, personal terms with the club. But to me, Matty wants to be in Newcastle. Otherwise, he wouldn't have signed that contract extension. Um, I've, I know players. Um, there was a player in the championship, I think, at Charlton. His contract was running out and he signed an extension. He basically left the club and he was a, one of the top strikers. Matty could do the same, but Matt, Matty's a jury. He wears his heart on his sleeve. He wants to be at the football club. Do you know, what I mean? it's, a, it's been a dream to play for Newcastle. And you can't stop these kids' dreams that want to play for the club and they'll give their all for the club. So, realistically, the club have got to give him an offer that he deserves. I know he'll be asking for X amount, but you've got to compromise. You've got to work, it's got to work both ways. Andy Carroll's now signed a new contract. That was uh, another one that was you know, talked about quite a lot uh, in the build-up to Project Restart. Happy to see him commit for at least another season? It's a, to me, it's, a, it's a, a difficult one and a strange one, but then you've got to look at what was in his deal prior to signing the contract. Did he have a clause in his contract that if he played so many games, he gets a new deal? And then the ball's in Andy Cowell's court, not the club's, the club's court, do you know what I mean? They, they would have had to give him an extension. Um, I was reading today that he, he's struggling for the for the game tomorrow against Man City, um, which is is a bit bizarre because obviously he's been getting himself fit uh, from his latest injury over over the break they've had, and then he, he's come back and played a couple of games. He's, he's set one up in, in one of the games. He's done well when he's played. Um, it can make a difference when when he's on the pitch, but. It's trying to get him on the pitch and keep him on the pitch. That's the that's big question. So if you're paying Andy Cowell big money that is struggling to get on the pitch, then I go back to why can't you not give Matty Longstaff a little bit more money that, to a player that can play and is fit regularly. So, like I said, the, the, the ball could have been in Andy Cowell's court. It could have been how many games you've played. If you, if you get a new deal and, and that sort of thing, Steve. So Newcastle United might, might have had no option. Yeah, true. Other, uh, other notable departures um, from the club have seen goalkeeper Rob Elliott leave and, of course, uh, Jack Colback and Jamie Sterry. Um, you know, first Rob Elliott. Um, we mentioned St Maximum buying into the area and uh, buying into the community as well as the football club. Rob Elliott was another another one who did that. Yeah, he done he done really well. He set up his own uh, academy, which which was brilliant. Do you know what I mean? He he was there. Um, he he lived down on the coast. He loved it. Do you know what I mean? And not many people from play for Newcastle decide to go and live down Timeout. Um, and he did. He like he liked to be down there and, and outside of training. He would always try and help the, the football kids in. Um, in the area, trying to to help them with his uh, elite academy he had, which to me was fantastic because there's not many players that will go out there way and give their time to uh, to try and help the kids, the future kids of Newcastle United. Uh, hopefully, he can continue to do that, even if he goes to another club. I'm pretty sure he loves the area. Do you know what I mean? Otherwise, he wouldn't have stayed here for so long. He wouldn't have set the academy up that he's done if he if he didn't want to want to be around this place. Um, so hopefully he can continue to, to be in around the area because I think having people like him in the area and trying to encourage the young players and um, this generation um, to improve their football skills, it, it can only benefit the football club. Um, there hasn't been the next Paul Gascoigne sort of thing, do you know what I mean, for years and years. And hopefully with these academies that the professional players are doing, then that could help. Jack Colbert didn't have the happiest of time at Newcastle, so it was no surprise to see Jack leave. But Jamie Sterry was was tipped for big things at one point. What do you think went wrong there? I think it was just game time. Um, obviously, being a local lad, um, you're getting a routine of I'm a Newcastle United player and squad player and that sort of thing. Um, did he? To me, he should have went out on, on loan a long, a long time before he did. Um, and then he should have went out on loan again this season and tried to learn his trade and, and show the managers what he could do. Obviously, he had a, he had a really good pre-season 
training a really good pre-season this year as well in, in China. Um, he was playing a few games right back in the right midfield, set up a couple of goals, and then you're thinking he might get a chance. Um, but he, he hasn't, to me, he hasn't fulfilled his potential that they kept him at the club for to do. Uh, obviously, he's got great ambition. Um, he's a fit lad. Um, and hopefully he can he can get a club and, and do well. And you never know. He's he's still a young lad, and in a couple of years they might they might bring him back, like what they've done with the with the goalkeeper Mark Gillespie. Do you know what I mean? They released him a few years ago, and he went out and learned his trade and done well in Scotland. And they've, they've brought him back down to to Newcastle United. And you never know what can happen in the future for these young players that have, have left the club. You know much about Mark Gillespie? Obviously, that's our first signing of. Uh, next season, I suppose, uh, but it's a it's a needs must basis. We do need a keeper, especially with us losing Elliot. Obviously, the situation regarding Woodman is still very much unclear. So, do you know much about him? Is that a is that a decent signing for Newcastle? Well, he's a, he's a local lad. Um, he's obviously done well in Scotland. Um, the, the obviously, he'll be third choice. I don't think Woodman will be staying. Um, so, yeah, I think. It, it will be a good appointment. You've got a, a young goalkeeper that's ambition, um, that's got ambition, wants to play for the club, knows the area, knows the fans, black and white through and through. You bring them to the club and he, he, like I say, he bleed black and white. So, and he's not going to kick up a fuss, do you know what I mean, if he's, if he's not playing like some players do. Um, so, look, I've not seen him play, but it could be a, a good appointment to have a, a third choice keeper, do you know what I mean? And, um, with Woodman, there's been talk about him going to Celtic. Um, obviously, he's done well in the Championship, but I think with him, he needs to he needs to be playing regularly. And he's not going to do that in Newcastle United. So, I think it'll probably be the right time for Newcastle United to cash in on him. Yeah, yeah, I would agree 100%, mate, definitely. Um, got a few questions coming in, mate, on, on Twitter. Um what is the quickest goal you scored coming on as a substitute, Paul Shanks? It's always, it's always worth mentioning that, mate. Yeah, obviously the the uh, the Sunderland one. Um, look, even even to this day, do you know what I mean? It was in two thousand and six, and we're talking fourteen years ago. Do you know what I mean? You know, it's, it's people started, and look, I'm privileged. Do you know what I mean? It's great to go down in history, and and that sort of thing. Of local rivals, but nah, it's it's nice. It's dream come true. Do you know what I mean? To run on the pitch and score with your first touch, and I, I couldn't have made my family more proud when when the ball hit the back of the net and was against Sunderland. Good stuff. Uh, Karim says, "Do you think the Newcastle takeover will still go through and see Brussels stay on if it happens?" But we haven't mentioned the dreaded takeover word. Um, I think we bored ourselves rigid of that over the last few months, but. Um, my view before you, you know, before you answer would be that you know we're we're reaching the end game, and you know I think there's been a lot of stuff going on in the the world, geopolitical world, which we've been drawn into, which would suggest that you know the relationship between our country and Saudi Arabia has has continued to improve, and you know that would point very much forward to the government not standing in the way of this and the Premier League giving it the green light. So, you know, what's, what's your views? Well, everything that the Saudis are doing at the minute kind of points to the direction that the takeover is going to happen. Obviously, they've, they've tightened up on the, the privacy and everything in, in Saudi and, and that sort of thing, which you never know. Um, the Premier League might have said, look, before this takeover is actually going to happen, you've got to show us that you're willing to do something. You're willing to stop this happening in, in Saudi Arabia. And to be fair, fair credit to them. They've done that in the kingdom. Do you know what I mean? They've they, they put the foot down and with the privacy and people can go to jail if it happens and, and, and that sort of thing. And then obviously the, the latest news today that the, the government have, have agreed to start selling weapons again to, to the Saudis, which, look, if the Saudis were that bad and they were killing people that they shouldn't have been killing, there's no way the government would sell weapons to them. Do you know what I mean? And, and that sort of thing. Um, and I don't care. People can go into politics and, oh, but they killed this person in Turkey and they're doing this with Yemen. And that. 
there's, there's reasons why these things happen, do you know what I mean? And we don't know anything about why these are happening. It's just, things happen in the world and they happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. And the US government are not stupid and they wouldn't want to help studies um, with these issues, do you know what I mean? They would, they would back them in the UK if there were, if there were bad people and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, they, they starting to tighten up on things and all the, the positive news coming out of Saudi Arabia and the positive positivity stuff, what they're doing, points to one direction for me and that's the takeover will probably happen pretty soon. The other question is, the other part of the question was, do you think Steve Bruce will stay? I think he would love to stay um, for what he's done this season. A lot of people rip him off, me included. Uh, but I don't think he would be the right man um, for the job. I think you need to bring in people that have got a name. They're, they're used to dealing with high-profile players because you're going to be bringing top-class players to the football club that might be hard to deal with. Um, so you need a manager that's been comfortable with these players and knows how to how to treat them and how to react to them. Uh, and after speaking to, to some players that Newcastle win on a Saturday, what it used to be, they win on a Saturday, they get two, three days off. Top uh, class managers don't... Yeah, no, no, no. Do that. They want to win. They want their players in training and realise on what they did wrong on a Saturday, even though they won the game, and try and put things right. John Gandhi asks, as a former Watford and Newcastle player, what is his prediction for the game at the weekend? And what were his favourite moments playing for Newcastle and for Watford? Uh, I'll give my prediction. Obviously, Watford are fighting relegation. Newcastle are safe. Uh, look, it'll, I, I think it'll be a draw. Um, Newcastle will play with a lot of confidence at the minute, whereas Watford need points. Um, so I think it'll be a draw. Obviously, my main um, my main things in my head and the, the exciting news for me when I was playing for Newcastle was making my debut against Everton in the Worthen Club. Uh, I worked so hard to to get to where I wanted to be. I had to make a lot of sacrifices along the way, and I did that. Um, thankfully for me, it all came to, to, to plan and I eventually put on the black and white shirt. It was a dream come true. Uh, as for Watford, it was, it was a, a dream and it was a privilege for me to get um, being given the opportunity to play in an FA Cup semi-final against Southampton in uh, 2002, I think it was. Even though we lost 2-1, it was, it was a great learning curve for me. And then to go and uh, we beat, we played Burnley away, Stephen. We we beat them seven four, and I scored four goals, which which was magnificent. You know what I mean? I think before me, uh, I think the only person to do that was Luther Blissett, and he was he was a great goal scorer. Um, I think Troy Deeney scored four last year or the year before, but other than us three, I don't think many people have done that. Um, so yeah, I've got great mem memories of, of playing for Watford and. The, the learning curve they, they give me and put me on the right path to become a professional footballer. You've got to thank them for it, do you know what I mean? Uh, Durham Mag says, how did it feel to pull on a Sunderland strip and play in front of a stadium full of Mackhams? <laughs> Look, people talk to me and they ask me why I did it and that sort of thing. And Look, I, I was living in Cardiff at the time. And I want to have an opportunity of being back in the North East. Uh, playing for playing for Sunderland didn't really come into my mind. Uh, I wanted to be living in the North East, living in Newcastle. Uh, I had my friends and family here. Um, we were expecting a baby as well, which I wanted to, to be a Geordie. Um, and another thing was, you want to play in the Premier League. You want to play in the best division in the world. And for me, playing for Sunderland, whether it was Sunderland Mills or whoever, it, it, it didn't come into it. You've got to. There's only so many times you get opportunities to play in the Premier League, and only so many opportunities come around, and you've got to take them with both hands. And for me, if I had to turn that down, I might never have got that opportunity to play in the Premier League again. So I wanted to prove myself that I could score goals in the Premier League. And people will say, "Well, it was for Sunderland," but. 
look, it doesn't matter, do you know what I mean? At the end of the day, you've got to think about what your career is and being a footballer, your career is very short and you've got to, you've got to do as much as you can in probably 12, 15 years and that's probably one of the reasons why I signed for Sunderland as well. Yeah, good answer. Uh, Peter Pork Pie Robson says, which player, manager, did you dislike working with the most? I think the player would probably be Craig Bellamy. Um, I played with him in Newcastle. Um, Craig Bellamy could probably have a fight with himself in front of the mirror. He was so argumentative. And he would pretty much try and cause a fight with anyone. I was just a young kid coming through. But I've seen it when the way he was speaking to Alan Shearer and the way he was speaking to some of the other pros that were big, big players. Um, then I went to Cardiff and he came to Cardiff as well and I've seen a totally different person. And then when I, one of the reasons why I left Cardiff was pretty much down to Bellas. Um, told the chairman and the new owner that came in that I was a bad apple and a bad egg and pretty much get rid of me. And, I had achieved a lot of Cardiff and the goals I scored down there. So, Bellas is probably one of the worst players I've played with. Uh, as for managers, um, probably Graeme Souness when, when he was in Newcastle. Uh, I was coming through the reserves as a young kid and playing reserve team football. Newcastle had a striker crisis. I think Michael Owen was into it, Shearer. Um, there was a, all the strikers were pretty much injured. Shola was injured, uh, Lua Lua. And we started to play Kieran up front. And I think we had a reserve game on the Monday. And I scored two or three goals. Uh, went into his office and pulled him. You're going to give me a chance in the first team. And now you've got no strikers. I've done well in the reserves. And he just basically told me, you just stop, stop there, stop there. And I looked at him, he's like, reserve team football doesn't count. And I just started laughing. I was like, what do you mean it doesn't count? He says, why, why, why am I playing reserve team football if it doesn't count? If you think it counts, why do I even bother it? So, yeah, great students, just basically because of that. Do you know what I mean? People have a different opinions of the guy because of what he's done in Liverpool. But I've probably seen the bad side of, of Graham Souness and it always sticks in my mind. Uh, Ledman says, hi, Michael. Um, hope you're well. He, he's we've got a couple of couple of cranks on here, I think, mate. About ten years ago, I lent you I lent you a quid in the bookies. You said, mate, the bandit's ready to drop. Have you got a quid on you till I get to the cash point? I've turned around, I put my bet on, and you'd gone. Can you send him the <laughs> quid back? <laughs> I couldn't imagine that would be true. Like <laughs> classic, absolute classic. Um, let's move on to Man City, mate. And, you know, as I, as I touched upon earlier on with the FA Cup, um, you know, we were you know, both disappointed. We didn't go for it, and, and rightly so. Um, he reverted to, you know, a, a very defensive formation against them in the FA Cup. But when you look at the games that we've played in the Premier League, we're unbeaten in, you know, six matches now. We've scored 10 goals since coming back from lock, lockdown, playing a back four. Um, so, you know, what do you think he's going to do tomorrow night? Do you think he's going to park the bus again for the Premier League trip, or do you think he's going to give it a go? Obviously, there's there's a few injuries. Um, he's done his press conference today. There's a few doubts. It doesn't look like St. Maximum or Almir <laughs> fit. Um, Andy Carroll has a strain, so there's talk of him missing the game as well. Um, you know, so there's, there's you know we're missing a few players tomorrow night as well? I think if he had a full strength team to pick from, I think he would have probably tried to win the game. I think he would have probably went 4-4-2 or 4-3-3. Knowing that Newcastle are not safe. Um, obviously, if they weren't safe and they were fighting relegation and needed points, then I think they would revert to a back five. But then you talk about them players you've mentioned. Um, out of the strikers who's left, there's only Joe Linton left, isn't there? Who, who can play attacking? Obviously, you've got Richie that can play on the left. Um, Lazaro can play right wing. Um, but you, you, you haven't really got many unless he plays four four two with Hayden or Shelby in behind Joe Linton, 
which which could happen. But I think since since the project restarts happen, I think Newcastle United have been the best, have played the best when they're going at teams and they're trying to attack teams. Because I think a lot of teams expect Newcastle to sit back and they haven't expected Newcastle United to be on the front foot on the front foot. I think I was looking the other day in, in the first half, um I think it was against West Ham. I think the possession was something like seventy three. Do you know what I mean? And normally it's the, it's the other way around. So, look, the players are playing full of confidence. They've got nothing to lose. Hopefully, Steve Bruce can go out there and, 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 and give it a go. Do you know what I mean? Like I said, you've got nothing to lose. Is he thinking that they've got a chance of getting into Europe? So, could we nick a point? There's, there's a lot of things that will be on his mind. Do you know what I mean? I just hope he goes out there and tries to to give them a, go, a game, do you know what I mean? Because realistically, Man City have got nothing to play for at this moment in time as well. True. Uh, Westy asks, uh, what did you make of Kasogi's uh, partner's latest interview? Uh, I'm not sure whether you saw it. It was on uh, Good Morning Britain with Piers Morgan today. Um, she was basically wheeled out again to discuss, obviously, the atrocious murder of the journalist Kasogi in Saudi Arabia, something which we've been, you know, drawn into with this takeover talk. And um, we basically, you know, took the opportunity to say that she didn't want the takeover to go through after being prompted, of course, by Piers Morgan, a well-known Arsenal fan. So, you know, what was... Did you see it? And, um, you know, are you a little bit sick and tired of, a, of the, the narrative which seems to be against this takeover? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sick and tired, Steve. It's just time and time. There's different stories come out every day. And obviously, this, this story has been dragging on now since, the, since they accepted a bid um, and it went to the Premier League, which months ago, do you know what I mean? And for Good Morning Grim to, to bring this out and Piers Morgan to bring it out and try and get the government to stop it. And that's what, that's only why he's doing it. He's only bringing it on the show and trying to get the full England to get behind her and, and try and stop the government accepting and the Premier League accepting the bid. But the government have already come out and said they've got nothing to do with it. It's down to the Premier League. Um, look, it's, it's crazy how many people want to stop this, this, this takeover. Do you know what I mean? And, People don't. People, what people are forgetting is it's not just the Saudis that are involved. You've got Amanda Stalby and you've got the Rubin brothers. So you take away the Saudis and you, you've still got two people that still want to buy a football club. Um, and if they didn't accept it, it would be very harsh on, on the two other parties. Um, it's, just, it's just nonsense and, and crazy the amount of publicity one person can get over something that's happened. Do you know what I mean? Look, we don't know why it's happened. Things have happened. They wouldn't invite the guy to the to the embassy in, in Turkey if, if he hadn't been doing something wrong. Do you know what I mean? Something's happened behind the scenes and we don't know. So until people know the truth, then people shouldn't really comment. Do you know what I mean? They shouldn't stop a takeover of a, of a football club. It's nothing to do with them. Do you know what I mean? It just it steal the balls my water and it just get angry every every time people mention it because why, why should it stop it? Do you know what I mean? It's, if they want to, it's their money. They can do what they want with it. Look, I, I, she was obviously in a relationship of some description with him. I feel very sorry for her and I feel very sorry for the family. However, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you read and you're never sure where, whether it's true or not. Some of the family claim they've never even heard of her. Um, you, you wonder whether, you know, some of these people are being wheeled out by, you know, um, other people to, to you know to cause mischief. Um, maybe it's even other countries. There's been rumours that the Qataris are behind this kind of thing. You see an explosion of Saudi accounts attacking, uh, you know, her whenever she speaks. So you know, it's it's not really something that we're interested in or want to be involved in. It's you know, it's a simple matter of Newcastle United having an owner who has you know treated the fans atrociously over the last 13 years and who just want to see the football club in a better place. It's as simple as that. And unfortunately, they're being used in a in, in, in a political game, you know? Look, we, 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 do you know what? We shouldn't be talking about a guy that's been killed and, and that sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? People, people, you should, people should be mourning the death in this 
thinking about all the good, the good things, the family, and look, the family will be devastated this is getting brought up again. Do you know what I mean? Because it brings back memories. And it's going to keep going on. And you know yourself when you've lost someone, you don't want to keep bringing it up time and time again. And year after year, you, you want to let them mourn and let them, let them rest in peace. But these people are just constantly bringing it back out in, in the press. And it, it doesn't matter how many times the government has said they're not going to intervene, people are still trying to, to bring it out and trying to get the whole world against Newcastle United again. And look, how many people are going to listen to the story about what's happened and all oh, this has happened, that's happened. Yeah, we do feel sorry for the woman. And she's lost the partner if she if she was actually with him. We've said that um, the family members don't even know who she is. But look, you got to feel sorry for the woman. But just let people get on with their lives. Do you know what I mean? It's, things have happened, and you, you move on. And like anything, if something happens in, in your family, you move on. You try and move on to the next thing, and you, you think positively. But there's just so much negativity going around at the minute that you just need some positivity coming out. Yeah. Kev asks, what, what do you think will happen to Newcastle when the takeover, uh, when this takeover fails? Where do you see us in four years' time? So Kev, Kev is obviously not very optimistic that the takeover is going to go through. I honestly think if this takeover fails, I think Newcastle United will struggle. Um, Mike's pretty much running the club down to its bare bones at this moment in time. Uh, not paying staff and and that and that sort of thing couldn't couldn't staff wages couldn't staff out of the football club getting rid of them. If uh, I believe that, I know they need to stay in the Premier League for him to earn a lot of money and and so and so. Um, but I, I couldn't see Mike putting a lot of money back into the club if if this fails. Um, I think he would just basically run it into the ground, and that's the worrying thing about it. And it could eventually end up being what's happening with with Sunderland and you look at Millsborough as well. I know they've got a good owner, but if you don't get things right, you can go down and you go down and you go down and it's, it's hard to get back up. Uh, that's why, hopefully, we need this takeover to happen because you've got an owner there that doesn't care about the football club, doesn't care about fans, only cares about one thing, himself. Um, so I if it didn't go ahead, I think it would be very worrying times for, for Newcastle United. Uh, Spenny Mag says, uh, did um, Michael ever get Bellamy back for taking his phone out? <laughs> <laughs> nah, I never got him back. Uh, I'm, I'm probably going to write a book and everything will be in it. Uh, like I says, we all have superstitions when, when you're a player. And when I was a player at Cardiff, I had uh, a few problems off the pitch that I was trying to, to help and Steve Black being the, the nice guy he was helped me along the way. Uh, people didn't know what was going on off the pitch with myself and he was trying to help me and, and that sort of thing. Um, people think they're doing what's best for the football club at the time and it wasn't. What was best for, for the football club was letting me get on with my life and the people that are helping me and taking my phone out of my pocket at half time and then that sort of thing. But my time will come, Steve. My time will come. <laughs> Good stuff, mate. Before we finish, mate, give us a quick um, you know, a quick prediction for the Man City game. Um look, it'll be tough, do you know what I mean? Especially with uh, with the players that, that Steve Bruce has come out and said that are doubtful or, or injured. I yeah, I can only see after the performance that Happened the other day against Man City. I can only see a Man City, Man City win probably two three nil. Um, if Man City turn up when De Bruyne turns up, then Newcastle United could, could struggle. Do you know what I mean? It's it's one of them things. But let's let's hope, fingers crossed, that I'm wrong and fingers crossed to get a point and start climbing up the table. But I, I can only see a Man City win at this moment in time. Fair play, mate. I think I'm in the same boat, especially with uh, players dropping like flies. Uh, I think we might see a rather different Newcastle over the next couple of uh, fixtures with uh, the other games on the horizon. Well, Tottenham Hotspur and, of course, Liverpool, the champions uh, to come to St James's Park as well. But look, 
we stayed up. We've got to be positive. We stayed up. We're in the Premier League, and now we just need the takeover to go through to make everybody happy. Yeah, that's right, Steve. They've got, look, they've got some big games against big teams. You know, only like you say, they play the champions. Um, you want to play against the best teams in the league, and you've got C, you've got Tottenham, you've got Liverpool. No better, no better teams to play against. And it'll be good viewing for the fans to watch. Do you know what I mean? We've got a chance to watch Newcastle United to see really how far they have come on. Uh, obviously, they've, they've undefeated in X amount of games in the league, but how far have they really come on? You'll see it against when they play the big boys, how, how good they are. Do you know what I mean? And that's when you judge yourselves. Great stuff as always, Michael. Lovely to speak to you. We'll catch up again soon. Yes, thank you.